Again, aloha. Uh, my name is John Hart. Uh, welcome to the State of Hawaii Department of Transportation's 2021 Protect Our Water Conference. Um, I'm your moderator for this session. Uh, it's titled, The Five Pillars of Construction Storm Water Management. Uh, as a reminder, please uh, use the Q&A se uh, section uh, during the session to ask any questions you may have. And at the end uh, of the presentation, our speaker, uh, we'll have a few minutes uh, to answer some of the questions uh, that are you know, that you guys submit. Uh, now it is my privilege to introduce our speaker for this session, Barry Fagan. Barry guides uh, clients at the intersection of natural and built environments. He has done so for the past 30 years. Barry currently leads the Environment and Infrastructure Group for Alabama-based Volker, who is a national firm where he fulfills part of his personal mission of helping good people get better at managing stormwater. Also, before joining Volker, Barry was the Alabama Department of Transportation's environmental program engineer, who he is with for over 20 years. Again, it's my privilege. Please join me in welcoming Barry Fagan. Thank you, John. Hey, everyone. That's, uh, that's how we say aloha here in Alabama. I'm Barry. Um, John has an excuse for all of our fumbling. It's early in the morning there, but I guess my only excuse is that I'm hungry. It's uh, it's lunchtime here, so I uh, appreciate you you sitting in with us. Uh, I'm with Volkert, and as John mentioned, Volkert's uh, an engineering and consulting firm that's been around for almost 100 years now, providing infrastructure services. We've got offices from Texas to New Jersey and down the East Coast and Florida and everywhere in between and, and basically on the other side of the planet from you guys. But that group that I lead, uh, environmental planners and designers and permitting and compliance professionals, we work all over the country. So uh, if you ever need anything, just, just let us know. Um, I met many of you at last year's conference virtually. And, and so I, I had you in my home last year. This year, I have you in my office. And I'm thinking that next year, the next time we need to get, get together, it needs to be at your place. So I'm looking forward to that uh, invitation. So um, before we get started talking about stormwater, I need to learn just a little bit more about you. So John, if you could put up, uh, put up the first poll slide. Uh, I wanna know which, um, hopefully that'll, that'll come up in just a second, but, but which group of BMPs, which groupings of BMPs are your favorites? And so just pick one of those, whichever, one is appropriate for you. I know it's a really personal question. It's like asking someone which which child is their favorite for a stormwater professional, and uh, and I'll share with you what my favorite is a little bit later. So, um, John, we didn't even uh, ask how do we see the results. I'm not seeing results yet. I, I do have the results. Okay, okay. Could you share with me the top two so far? Top two so far are. By 33% is silt fence, inlet protection, and sediment basins, followed by vegetation, uh, rolled erosion control projects, and hydro mulch. Perfect. And okay, the next ask. question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go right ahead. Sorry. Okay. The, the next question is similar to that one, um, but a little bit different. So I'm going to hit the X on the poll on my screen. You may need to do that for yours also. And I'm going to go to the next question, which is. Oh, I just saw the, uh, the results there. So um, now the next question, which group of BMPs is, uh, do you see most often on your projects? So it's a similar question and it's okay if your answer is different uh, on this one, it's an anonymous poll. And John, uh, yeah, thank you. So I just saw the results and they, they went away. Tell me what those first two were again. Silt fence, inland protection and sediment basins, vegetation, rolled erosion control products, and hydro mulch. Okay, so those were those were the same. That's that's a good sign. If you would have told me that you really like silt fence, but but all you ever see is uh, is um, I don't know whatever the other one was project planning, project specification plans. Those are the only things. Then there would be a kind of a disconnect there, and and that would have been something that we we would need to need to talk through. So you're, you're at least consistent. What you think are the most effective practices on your projects there in Hawaii, that's actually what you're doing. And that, that's a good thing that you're consistent. 
Um, but we're gonna we're gonna think through that a little bit more uh, as we go through this presentation. So uh, let me get back in in charge here. So so our our professional challenge as we as we go through here, if if you would have shown me a gap between what you knew and what you were doing, then then I would encourage you to uh, to to try to close that gap at all all uh, at every every turn you you had every opportunity you had. And that's the same for this conference and for this presentation. Today, you're gonna, you're gonna take stuff into your brain, you're gonna increase your knowledge, and it will be your job to narrow that knowing versus doing gap when you get back to the office. And, and so it's my job to, to help widen that gap and while you're here, and then it's gonna be your job to narrow that gap once you get back to work. But it's gonna take some thinking, and I'm, I'm gonna challenge you to think a little bit differently especially seeing your results uh, on those polls, I wanna challenge you to think a little bit dif differently going forward. And, and John, uh, leadership author, Dr. John Maxwell says that that's a, the, an organization's greatest challenge is to get its employees to think and to do, do things in order of importance. So, so let's get our brains warmed up just a little bit. And I've got a little, little teaser here. It's a, it's a, an old trick, you've seen it before, it ought to be very familiar. You saw it in elementary or, or junior high school when you were learning about uh, parallax and optical illusion. And the trick question was, which of these two lines is longest? And the trick answer was, was what? You don't have to, you can say it, say it out loud if you want, but the trick answer was neither of them are longer. Uh, they're, they're the same length, right? Well, no, that, that is not true anymore. I made the top line longer for the, to, to just uh, to challenge your thinking. And so you just responded rationally to a world that you understood and that you recognized, but no longer exists. And so we do that with construction stormwater sometimes. We, we get to a place where we feel confident, we feel comfortable and safe and secure in our answers and our solutions to, to managing construction stormwater but the world has passed us by. Technology is advancing. The state of practice is advancing. And, and what happens to us as professionals, if we, if we sit where we're safe and secure and we don't continue to challenge our own thinking and the thinking of others, is one day we will be rendered irrelevant. And that ought to be uh, the scariest thing you can, you can uh, think about as, as far as being a professional. So, um, and 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 we're gonna we're gonna talk about change today. Uh, I guess associated with that that different thinking. And and fortunately, I've been a part of a lot of change over my career. I worked for the uh, the Alabama Department of Transportation, as John mentioned, for 26 years, and uh, I helped to develop the uh, the stormwater and and modern environmental programs of ALDOT while I was there. Maybe the last half of my career was spent. Uh, helping to develop those those programs and and so prior to that Aldot would we only changed when we were forced to and and I, I used to tell folks that that if we put off doing right things long enough sooner or later a regulator would beat us over the head and make us do it their way and 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 so we made a decision we, we had to change our thinking to get our program headed in the right direction and it took several years to do that but we started taking ownership of, of our own program. And if, if, if the way we were um, protecting the environment, if collaterally that also was, uh, was compliant with the regulation, then, then, then great. But we didn't want to, to, to uh, drive our program. We're a transportation agency. We didn't want the environmental agency dictating what we did. So, so we decided to take ownership of our own program. And so I was, uh, my, my, my job for the last six or seven years, I was the environmental program engineer. And so I worked directly for our chief engineer. And one of my goals was to develop a culture at ALDOT that where, where everyone took responsibility for protecting the environment, the designers, the maintenance folks, the construction folks. It wasn't just Barry's job. It wasn't some internal activist that they could point to and say it's his fault or it's his job. I wanted everyone thinking that way. But it was difficult. It was difficult to make that case because ALDOT wasn't created for the purposes of, of protecting the environment. Uh, the people who work there, they didn't sign up for, for that, if that makes sense to you. 
uh, the, the purpose or the mission of ALDOT was to provide a transportation system for the movement of people and goods. And it's similar there in, in Hawaii. Your state legislature set up and created the, I don't know what it was in the beginning, Department of Roads or Department of Highway Department, but to, to provide a safe, efficient, accessible, and sustainable intermodal transportation system that ensures the mobility of people and goods and enhances and or preserves economic prosperity and the quality of life. That's a long way of saying uh, we're going to provide a transportation system for the movement of people and goods, but, but the people who come to work there, they probably didn't go to school to, the most, most of them anyway, didn't go to school to manage the environment or protect the environment. They went to school to be engineers or, or something else geotechnical or structures or, or some other element of transportation work. And so it's hard to make that case sometimes. And, and so I developed a, a messaging that tied our mission to our responsibilities. And since I've been with Volker, since uh, 2016, I've worked with departments of transportation all over the country. And, and when I lay this, this connection out for them, it seems to be helpful as they uh, continue to, to, to try to uh, make that connection on their own. So, that, so here's how it goes. The mission of your DOT is to provide that transportation system for the movement of people and goods. And in order to uh, deliver that mission, you have to engage in activities that have the potential to negatively impact the environment. And it's that potential that triggers our environmental responsibilities. And those may be in the form of regulation or they may be in the form of, of uh, social expectations. Our neighbors expect us to behave in a certain way as we're delivering that transportation system. And so we, we absolutely need permits and clearances and authorizations from our regulators. And we also need the, the buy-in from, from the people who pay our salaries and the people who, who pay for the work that's being done. And if we fail to fully address our environmental responsibilities, it makes it difficult to fulfill our mission. So if you want to continue to build roads, bridges, maintain things the way that, that we do, then we have to address these environmental responsibilities. It's simply something that we, we have to do. And so that has helped uh, some DOTs to, to kind of convey that message of uh, this, this isn't just the, the, the environmental office's job, this is everyone's job to uh, address these responsibilities. And so, um, you know, I, I started looking at risk when I was at, at ALDOT and uh, I, I saw that, uh, well, first of all, I, I don't personally like the terms erosion control and sediment control. I think that they, they make us sound like we're better than we, we really are. They're, they're kind of misleading. We, we don't control the weather. We don't control how much it rains, how hard it rains, how often it rains. We don't control the soils that we have to work in. We oftentimes, we don't get to control how much space we have to work in. We don't control who our neighbors are and we don't control the personalities of our regulators. And all of those variables can sink us. And so we don't have control over much of anything. That's kind of an illusion. You know, managing construction stormwater is probably the best we can do. And, and the way we go about, should go about managing is looking at the risks associated with, with stormwater. And I've, I've been working on uh, uh, utility scale solar facilities for the last couple of years. And, and most of my clients in that space are investors and, and they are absolutely looking at risk. They literally have uh, dollars to lose or gain by the effectiveness of our stormwater management efforts. And, and so looking at, um, at, at risk is something that I do. I, I don't, you know, and typically I do uh, quality assurance type inspections and consultation. And, and so I'm not out there inspecting whether or not silk fence is trenched in. I'm looking at the site from the point of view of a, an investor and, and, and the point of view of, hey, what's unnecessarily going to cost money out here? So we look at, at regulatory risk. Is there a potential for a fine? And as you guys know, the fine is usually just a small part of a regulatory issue. It's, it's the cost associated with uh, regaining compliance and, and dealing with, with all of the people and entities surrounding that, that issue. That's where the, the problems come in, contractor claims and that sort of thing. Uh, environmental risk, 
most of the solar developers I deal with actually have a solid environmental ethic. And I would argue that most of us do also. And so it's, it's, harm, it's hurtful uh, when we see that our project is, is creating a mess out there. Uh, community expectations. Sometimes your community doesn't want you there in the first place. And now you've got sediment in their pond or in their yard. And so uh, I'm looking at those risks. Is, is, uh, is there someone out there that's gonna sue us? The Clean Water Act set, uh, put a uh, provision in for citizen lawsuits. And so we citizens can sue us under the terms of the Clean Water Act, requirements of the Clean Water Act, and under the allowable penalties. They can use that as their basis for their, uh, their uh, I guess, the money they're expecting. Uh, operation and maintenance, is, this, uh, is it going to be harder to uh, maintain this, this place when we get finished? And then uh, contractual, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to say, okay, contractor, if you break it, you buy it. But in, in terms of construction stormwater management, if we're not setting the contractor up for success, he may have an argue against our, the, our uh, making him pay the fine or him go get the sediment out of the neighbor's pond. And and so we have to uh, we have to be on our game as far as our contract language and and making sure that we are actually enforcing our contracts. Uh, so there's a, an element of contractual risk there that we have to deal with also. And so as we were getting our minds right, we were, we were able to really start to figure out some things on the technical side. So once we once we said, okay, we're going to own this game. Where mere compliance is risky for us. We're going to own it. We're going to do what we need to do, and hopefully, compliance will come along. Uh, we started to see um, uh, the technical side. We started attacking the technical side, and I got really nerdy with it uh, there in the beginning. And the the revised universal soil loss equation was uh, my friend there for a while. And and but I found out pretty quickly that it's hard to communicate the revised universal soil loss equation. It's hard to to incorporate that into our specifications and into our designs. And, and one day, or maybe uh, over a, a short period of time, I started to realize that the value of the Russell equation wasn't in its variables. It's actually in, its, uh, in the units of the, the product that it spits out. So that, that product, A, is the average annual soil loss. That's, that's how much sediment is trying to leave your site uh, for, for a certain period of disturbed acreage for a certain period of time, tons per acre per year, or massive sediment per um, area of disturbance per duration of disturbance. So I knew I wanted the, the tons to go down. I wanted the, the mass of sediment trying to leave my site to go down. And just mathematics will tell you, if you want that to go down, down then you've got to either or and make the, uh, the area of disturbance go down and or the duration of disturbance. So I started asking myself and others, can we cause the area of disturbance to go down? And the answer is yes, we absolutely can by managing the work of the contractor. Can we make the duration of disturbance go down? Can we delay that disturbance? And then once we have to disturb, shorten it, uh, uh, lessen it beyond what we, we're seeing out there right now. And the, the the answer to both those questions is a, a resounding yes, we can, but we've got to have a plan and we need a good framework uh, to, to, to work within. And, and so we developed the, um, the five pillars of construction stormwater management uh, over a period of years of, of pain and misery and, and lesson learning. And, uh, and, and I've been leaning on the five pillars for, I think, over 15 years now. And I've applied the five pillars at you know, to different types of construction, transportation environments, residential, uh, and, and I mentioned solar development, uh, really any type of construction out there, you can apply the five pillars to, you can apply them at any stage of construction, planning and design, uh, construction, even in my job, I'm, I'm brought in after there's a mess out there and as, you know, to, to help clean up, I start walking through the five pillars as I do that. I'm doing some work for a DOT now where I go out about once a week and look at projects, kind of a quality assurance. And uh, as I'm driving up, I'm thinking about communication, work, are we managing water, and then managing erosion and sediment. And so those five pillars, that didn't come to me uh, in, a, in a dream all at once. It was, 
again, over a period of years, and it evolved in a kind of a backward fashion, which makes sense now, but, it, you know, going through it, you, you couldn't see the end. And so our, our program, our stormwater program is uh, at ALDOT, is, it's a, still a good program. And uh, like most good programs, it got its start with a good old-fashioned regulatory butt spanking, and, and then we headed on our way. But when we first started, we, we went out to tackle sediment. We saw sediment as our problem, sediment in the neighbor's pond, sediment in the wetland, sediment in the stream. And, and pretty soon we realized that sediment wasn't our problem. It was a symptom of a larger problem or a larger set of problems. And we started tracing back, where's this sediment coming from? Where's the, what's the source of this sediment? And we realized that if we can keep this, the soil particle up here, we don't have to work so hard to catch it down here in the end. And you know, on top of that, we don't have a sediment trap in the world big enough to, to handle all the sediment from a DOT project if that's all we're doing. So we've got to work on managing the source. And, and a lot of programs stop there. They feel cultured that they have, uh, it's erosion and sediment control now. It's not just sediment control, uh, but we wanted to, to go further than that. What's causing the erosion was our next question. And, and we realized, of course, in Alabama and in, in Hawaii, it's, it's water. Water is creating your erosion. So how can we move that water from one side to our, of our project to the other without adding sediment to it? And so we started diverting and conveying water from one side of the job to the other. And, and what that did for us was it, um, it reduced our workload to just the raindrops that fell on our site. So um, that, was, that was a big uh, revelation. But then we realized that our contractors really need to be a part of this, this story because we're not out there operating bulldozers and, and track hose. And, and so we realized that our contractors are capable. They're smart, they're innovative. And they can do just about anything we ask them to do as long as we tell them up front and we're willing to pay for it. And so we have to tell them up front. We have to lay out our priorities and expectations for them before they put their numbers on their, on their bids to turn those in. And, and so we, we realize that managing communication is the best management practice, not just with our contractors, but also getting information to our inspectors, the designer's intent, the, the construction bureau's intent, the, the director's intent, getting that to our inspectors, getting feedback from our inspectors, what works, what doesn't, even sharing externally with environmental advocacy groups and our neighbors and, and whoever else has a stake in this project. Uh, and we realized if we, if we didn't manage communication, we just weren't as successful or as effective as we could be. If we we could, we could set out to manage sediment only, but sooner or later we would be back up to managing communication and working our way through the, the five pillars. So let's walk through those now. Um, managing communication is, a, again, the best management practice. Uh, it includes all efforts to convey information among project stakeholders uh, in, a, in a way that increases effectiveness of, of our planning and design and implementation. Um, so what we're looking at here are uh, things like our, um, our pre-bid and pre-construction meetings, our specifications and plan notes, anything to convey the priorities and expectations of the one who's writing the check to the one who's, uh, who's getting paid to do the work, but also sharing um, information among those other stakeholders that I mentioned. And, and I'll, I'll go to it, into a lot more detail um, in the, the managing communication or the communication talk that will be not the next session, but the session after next, I'll be doing a, a communication topic session on that where we'll spend the whole, whole session on just communication. So, so just remember, we've, we've got internal and external stakeholders and uh, we need to be paying attention to both of those. And I um, was thinking I had a, a, another slide up, but I, I don't see it. Um, so the next managing work, this is actually my favorite of the five pillars of, of construction stormwater management. It, it, it challenges the way we've always done it. And I hear contractors, they, they, you know, I get pushed back from them. Well, I didn't, my daddy didn't do it this way. My granddaddy didn't do it this way. And I really have problems with doing things differently. And I get it. We're all human. We're, we're, we don't like change. Change creates this, at least a temporary sense of incompetence. 
And, and if we don't tell the contractor up front that we're gonna change, then it creates an element of risk for them. Uh, so that's one area of pushback that I get. Uh, another area is from our designers. And they say, Barry, we, we can't dictate the contractor's means and methods, can we? And I've heard that excuse for most of my career and, and to me, it is sometimes used as an excuse for a designer to not do their homework and think through truly, how is this job going to be constructed? They say, oh, leave it up to the construction folks and, and I can't dictate the means and methods. And my answer to that, my response to that is why not? The DOT is writing the check. The DOT decides, we write the contract. Um, the DOT gets to decide what things are, are in the DOT's interest and what things are not. And so the, the DOT ought to be driving that to an extent. I think there is a, a risk of uh, limiting the contractor's innovation and, and ability to find better ways of doing it. But if you know of something that will work and does work and you need to happen, you better be putting that in your specs or plan notes to, to make it happen. Um, so managing work includes staging and sequencing the project to delay and minimize the area and duration of disturbance that we talked about with the Russell equation. And it, it promotes a uh, continual pursuit of permanent stabilization. And that's one of my favorite sayings when I'm writing uh, uh, erosion and sediment control manuals or working with DOT programs as the continual pursuit of stabil permanent stabilization is what we're looking for. And that's not about managing erosion, that's about managing the work of the contractor. And that has to be built into the, the, the language of the contract. So this is kind of what it looks like on the ground. It's, it's about being intentional and, and telling the contractor, we want you to finish things as you move along. So here you see the, the finished front slope and ditch and back slope, uh, the contractor working on is uh, getting the, the subgrade built up. But beside me, the subgrade has not been worked on. And then behind me, um, there's mass grading going on. And then further down the road, there are still trees standing in the center line where the contractor hasn't advanced. It's, it's, it's limiting and delaying that disturbance. Same story here. We've got grading going on. The contractor hasn't even reached subgrade on the roadway, but yet you already see topsoil placed and tracked and, and, and solid sodding in this case. And you also see some established vegetation up at the top. LDOT has a spec uh, requirement that as a contractor cuts 20 feet into a slope, they have to immediately start their permanent stabilization. They have to apply topsoil and get their stabilization efforts going at 20 foot increments working their way down, down the slope. Um, this this uh, photo here, we, on this project, we had a 17 acre disturbance limitation. And you would think about it uh, typically moving down the project in 20 and 17 acre increments, finishing up as you go, kind of a rolling limitation. This contractor saw it was beneficial just, just because of the topography to cut the project down the center line. And so he's working on a section on the, the eastbound portion of the roadway. And while you see the porta potty there on the left, and the, there's a stake there. To the left, I'm sorry, to the right, the porta potty's on the right. There's a stake near it to the left of the porta potty. That's center line. And so you see the contractor's got permanent stabilization going on. He's working on his roadbed stabilization, and we haven't even cut the trees on the other side of the road yet. That's that was this contractor's method for keeping his project under 17 acres of, of, um, of disturbance limitation. Um, and I do. Uh, we're, we're going to have some time at the end. I, I made sure to, to give us plenty of time for that. So this is typically where I, I hear most of the questions coming when I'm presenting the five pillars is how did you get them to do that? So, so be thinking about that as you're uh, putting questions in the chat. So an, another, I guess, method of limiting and delaying uh, disturbance is what I call the early installation of cross drainage. And I picked this up from a a guy I met at an IECA conference from, uh, from Australia. And what they were doing is uh, they would go in, before they would clear the project, they would go into certain isolated spots and make sure they've got water flowing from one side or the other in an enclosed conveyance. And so in this case, and we, we adopted that at LDOT, and in this case, you can see there's a, a stream flowing down at the, the bottom of this, this slope that we're standing on, uh, the permanent, Conveyance is a, a, a precast box culvert. 
And so there's really no need for the contractor to clear beyond the tree line there um, that you see. There, there's another three miles of project to go. The center line runs right through the middle of that. And so we said, contractor, stop working here, stop clearing until you can get this stream uh, clean water in, clean water out at this location, because you really can't haul dirt across it and start filling in this bottom until we get that culvert in place. And so I think we allowed 10 acres of disturbance for the contractor to go in and do this, this work. They backfilled up to the top of the culvert. Uh, and then we allow them to continue clearing beyond that. And so we call that early installation of cross drainage. Another uh, approach or concept that we've, we've used, this one doesn't come up as much and oftentimes it comes up kind of as you're building the, the project. Um, it's, it's essentially moving the compliance point. I know that's not regulatorily correct, but but when you've got a, a situation, uh, take this, this project, for example, we've got steep slopes going down directly down to a stream. We don't have enough room at the stream to protect, uh, to keep all the sediment that's trying to get into that stream out of it. And so we fought that and fought that and then finally decided, hey, how about we just go ahead and finish these two steep slopes? Let's, let's focus right there, finish these two slopes, get them to a, a position where they're stable, and then we can fight and battle sediment up there on top of the hill, the, the photo on the left, that's up at the top. We could, we could handle sediment up there. We just couldn't handle it down there at the bottom where the slope goes straight into the stream. And so we, we accounted for contractor access. We, we stabilized their access roads with, with aggregate. We, we worked with them to determine where the, the crane pads would be. They've still got to put girders on this, this bridge. So they've got to get, uh, still have cranes down there, but we, we made designated spots where their crane pads would be. We stabilized those with aggregate, some of them with timber matting, and then uh, stabilized the access road getting out of there. And, and that uh, moving the compliance point, we can do that in other situations also where we simply don't have enough room to, to manage sediment there at the, at the resource that we're trying to protect. Managing water is, um, that includes all efforts to address the flow of waters through the project to protect the work area and minimize the work of erosion and sediment, managing erosion and sediment. So it's, it's really about dictating where the water goes and how it gets there. Water is dumb. We get to tell it where to go. We get to tell it how fast to get there. We get to tell it how to get there. And if you don't want water making its own way, just being pulled by gravity across your brand new, newly uh, tracked topsoil slope that's about to get seeding tomorrow, uh, then let's tell it where to go. Let's cut a, a swell up at the top and, and, and uh, give it a stabilized channel to get down to where it needs to be ultimately. Uh, but we can do that and, and we can do it relatively inexpensively. That you know, cutting a swell at the top of a slope is really one of the easiest things and cheapest things we can do. Uh, putting a berm up there is another way to divert and convey that water to get it to where we want it to go. And so we're, we're looking at conveying water across, under, around, over, and, and within our sites in a manner that does not create additional work for us. We, we want to manage that water in a way that um, it's, it's protected and, and we we adopted this mantra at Aldot of, of clean water in, clean water out. It's not our responsibility to, um, to clean up someone else's water once, it's, um, uh, once it enters our site. We, we, we don't add sediment to it, um, but, but we convey it and get it across our site. And some, some basics of, of managing water that we need to know, and these affects uh, erosion, uh, managing erosion and affect managing sediment, we've got to slow the water down. If, if we allow runoff to speed up, if we allow that velocity to double, it's erosive energy increases by four times. It's, it's the size of the particle that it can carry increases by 32 times. The mass of the soil being, being carried increases by 64 times. So, so we've got to slow the water down to re reduce its erosive energy and reduce its soil carrying capacity. And then we're getting down to managing erosion and managing sediment, which you guys do already. It sounds like from your survey, these are the things that you focus on and, and you're doing a good job with those. But, but 
really with managing erosion, it's all about keeping things covered up as long as you can. So, so there's existing vegetation or existing stabilization out there. Let's, let's put off clearing that or, or disturbing that as long as we possibly can. Then once we do clear it, we've got that per, uh, continuous pursuit of permanent stabilization and get back to an established form of, of managing erosion. And so this, uh, we've, we've come to the part where I start to anger the BMP gods, uh, BMP in this case being best manufactured product. Um, over my career, I've, I've had the opportunity to experiment with different products and different practices. And, and sometimes I get the opportunity to see them perform side by side. And I've, I've, I've had these opportunities on transportation sites and as you can see on, on large solar developments. And, and so I wanna just say out loud, uh, I've, I've compared um, traditionally blown and crimped uh, straw mulch erosion control against hydraulically applied of, of all sorts of flavors and types and costs. And in my experience, a good application of about two tons per acre of straw mulch crimped, it wins every time. It's, and, and it's much more mit, uh, effective at mitigating erosion, it lasts longer, and it's cheaper. So, so let the hate mail start flying. Um, managing sediment uh, includes everything we're doing to, to, to make uh, those suspended particles fall out of the, the runoff. And it's, it's really about capturing and slowing the runoff before it leaves. And you know, we, we, um, I, I gave you those facts of how it increases the doubling the, the velocity, increases the soil carrying capacity by 32 times or 64 times the size of the particle by, by 32 times. So really all we need to do is slow it down. And if your salesperson, while I'm on a roll with the uh, uh, best manufactured products folks, uh, if they're selling filtering to you, Tell them thanks. Uh, that's great that your product filters better than the other product, but really we don't count on filtering for, for any of these products. If they are truly removing sediment particles, soil particles, they're gonna clog up after the first or second rain. And that's actually a good thing for us because it helps to pond water. Now you just need to make sure that it's structurally uh, uh, sufficient to hold back to dam up that water the way we, the way we need it to. So, so we need to slow the water down and we need to, uh, to hang on to it as long as we can. And the type of soil will dictate how long you have to hang on to it uh, uh, in order to, to make those sediment particles fall out. So if you've got a clay soil like, like this site, you're gonna have to hang on to it much longer than if you had a, a sandy soil. And you're probably gonna need a treatment train of sorts like you see here. So, so we're trying to slow the water down and then we're trying to hang on to it with this big sediment basin. And you can see that the water is still kind of turbid. Um, and we were having issues with turbidity leaving even after this long treatment train. You notice the blue hose there uh, going up to that line of checks. I'll, I'll show you another video of what we were actually doing that day. We were, we were pumping water out of that sediment basin up into a series of checks where we had some flocculant uh, and, and had some jute netting there to catch the flocculated materials. But you can see, I think you can see the, the color of the water there. We were able to get the, uh, this runoff down into the 15 to 20 NTU range before we, before we uh, discharged it. So um, again, John, John Maxwell encourages us to, to think and to do things in order of importance. And, and I think that's what we've done with the five pillars of construction stormwater management. Uh, with the, the five pillars, we, we focus on the most effective BMPs and practices we have available to us first, communication, work, and water, and then, and then we get down to managing erosion and sediment. And those happen to be lined up in order of uh, economy also. It's, it's much cheaper to have a pre-bid meeting and way more effective to have a pre-bid meeting before the project starts. We tell everybody what's going on. Contractors can incorporate whatever they need to in their bids, and then we move on. That's much cheaper to do than trying to catch all our sediment, even with a sediment basin on the back end. So earlier, um, you know, we started the day with uh, with with the poll questions, and and you guys you selected sediment. I was I was a little little surprised, but those were the five pillars. They weren't listed in order, and they didn't have the pillar name listed next to them. But you guys, uh, you chose the uh, 
the most expensive, in my mind, least effective of the five pillars. And so, so you've got a challenge there. You, we need to think back, are we doing this the way we need to be doing it? Or are we sitting where it's safe and comfortable back in 19 whatever or 2000 wherever? And, and is there some work that we need to be doing? So I, I'm hoping that you're seeing some, some areas of improvement and asking yourself at least, at least two questions. You know, if, if we do happen to see that, that there's a better way of doing things and we're still stuck with silt fence, then, um, then who's going to make that decision? You know, if the stormwater professionals in the state of Hawaii aren't making those decisions, then, then who will be? So think about that and then think about, uh, is there a way we can incorporate the five pillars, all five of the pillars, starting with communication, working with managing work, managing water, and then managing erosion and sediment? Is there a way to supplement what you're already doing to make yourselves more effective without really raising the cost of what you're doing there? So um, today, I hope you're your knowing versus doing gap has been widened. I hope I've done my job and have created some work for you today. And um, I am happy right now, John, to, to answer any questions that might be in the chat and you guys feel free to, to keep adding. And also my, my email address is, is there. Um, I was thinking I had my phone number too, but anyway, email me if, if we don't get to, to your question today or if I can help you in any other way, send me an email. Hey, John. Barry, I, uh, everyone I sent uh, the thing, if you had any questions in the chat, I do not see any yet. Okay. John, do you have any Barry, questions? I have a quick question for you. Um, you know, we look at what other regions are doing, you know, typically we're looking for the tail that wags the dog. And for me, it's, my experience has been, you know, it's either region three or region four. Region four likes the polymers with the flocculants. Region three wants to make flow an effluent limitation. So what you currently in your experience do you think is, is that tail wagging the dog right now? Um, I, I don't know. I, the, the experiences I have, and I, I've, you know, I've got the, I've worked with the Ohio DOT on developing their construction stormwater manual, and they have adopted the five pillars to categorize, categorize their practices and even have a draft spec waiting there to incorporate the five pillars into their contract language. Uh, I'm currently working with the Nebraska DOT on updating their stormwater manual. And, and so I'm, I guess I'm so busy preaching what, what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, you know, using the five pillars actively in, in Alabama and Mississippi and, and, and Georgia and on solar sites and transportation sites. And so I'm, I'm not seeing pushback, except you mentioned flocculants. Some states do have hangups with flocculants. And that's that's fine, but if you if you take that tool out of the toolbox, you're going to have to hang on to that water even longer to get those those uh, soil particles to to settle out. And it makes it even much more important that you're also managing erosion and managing water. You don't want to take clean water, add your clay particles to it, and then try to get the sediment out. Uh, it's really important that you walk through those five pillars completely, especially if you can't use flocculant in the end. And I'm, I'm not sure if um, if I answered your question there about the, the yeah, tail can, wagging the dog, yeah. but yeah, we all just of our to, just trying I, to I mean, look forward to who might come out with the new things that we should always kind of look at because that is the you know the the wave of the future. But that's yeah, great, and I, great I, the the reason I, I brought up the uh, the hydro mulch is I'm I'm seeing hydro mulch being prescribed by regulators regulators who don't have the experience that we have in working uh, with this stuff. And, and I see flocculant being taken off the table because of um, really fear sometimes and, and sometimes a lack of information or even misinformation. And, and so I, I, I guess I do my preaching and, uh, and I'm happy to defend you know, the work that I do and mm -hmm. even to regulators. And I've actually convinced some regulators right. to, con to consider things a little bit different. Let me get to a couple of questions here. Uh, any lessons learned or recommendations on dictating uh, contractor means and methods, but still allowing for contractor flexibility? Yeah, so if, if you tell the contractor, you know, we're only gonna allow you 17 acres uh, of soil disturbance, you don't have to tell them exactly how to do that. Let them use their own uh, knowledge of their own equipment and, and capabilities 
And then once you have that one contractor that can do it, that can do it, they'll be a fan, I promise you. And then, uh, the, so the next contractor that complains about, about it, just say, hey guys, if you're not able or willing to do it, I know a contractor that can. And that's, that's kind you, of how we've approached that. You uh, also show the third uh, pillar, um, the managed water screen again real quick. Excellent. And I'm gonna end this here in a second. And there was one other question. Uh, have you ever encountered a situation where a surprise storm affected the work area that wasn't prepared when the soil is exposed? I think uh, we have all done that, but yeah. Yeah, and so that's a provision of managing work, actually, is you require your contractor to have a plan and have materials in place. So when you get the call that there's a hurricane on the way, at least for us, uh, that, that you're ready to go and your contractor at least has a plan that he can scramble and put together some sort of uh, a way to, to mitigate the damages that are coming your way. So thank you for those questions. Well, uh, thank you again, Barry. Uh, this now concludes the session. Uh, thank you everyone that uh, attended. Um, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, please return to the sessions tab to see the next breakout sessions. If you're experiencing any technical issues, please visit the info desk for assistance. Also, don't forget to stop by and check out all the vendors during your break. Appreciate it, everybody. Hello. Thanks, Thanks Sam. Bye. See ya.